Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the study of the book of Acts, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning with chapter 27, verse 1. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies, uh, the first 26 chapters, I urge you to go to my YouTube channel, find the playlist, the Book of Acts, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary, and watch this study from the beginning. The Book of Acts is one of the most important books of the Bible. If you don't understand it correctly, uh, you could be uh, some ha have some very, very serious doctrinal errors. Uh, but I'm going to pick up now chapter 27, verse 1, but I think it's important to uh, connect this to the last chapter and give you a little context. Uh, Paul is being sent to, to Rome. And at the end of the last chapter, um, King Agrippa uh, is in the territory where uh, Festus is, the governor. And um, Festus is holding Paul. He's held him for a couple of years. Um, but Agrippa is interested in Paul's case, and uh, he said he'd like to hear Paul's uh, you know, testimony. And so Paul and uh, also Paul's accusers, they present their case, and, and uh, King Agrippa makes the same verdict or conclusion that uh, Festus had, had come to, that, that Paul's completely innocent, that he doesn't deserve to be punished, and certainly doesn't deserve a sentence of death. And uh, they said that we would just release him. He should be set free, except for one thing. Paul, uh, early on, has uh, said because he's a Roman citizen, he has the right to go before Caesar in Rome. So Agrippa says, if it wasn't for that, we could have just released him. But now we're, we're forced to send him to Rome. And that's where we are, chapter 27, uh, verse 1 in the KJV. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, uh, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against uh, Sinaitis, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone, and hardly passing it came unto a place where is called, which is called the fair havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Well, I've noticed something in these first uh, seven verses that I, I think are important for us to not just miss. And uh, that's the, the way this is written uh, from the, uh, I think it's a third person perspective, uh, we. It says, uh, uh, and when it was determined that we should sail, uh, uh, we launched. Uh, the next day we touched at Sidon, uh, being with us, and so on and so on. It, it, uh, why, why is that important? Because this is a way of um, verifying that Luke is an eyewitness and a participant in all these events. Um, Luke starts off the book of Acts uh, uh, 
I was saying it, it's actually an epistle, in case you hadn't really thought of it that way, but it starts off saying he's writing to his his friend and giving wants to give him an account of all these things, and he's done all this research, and he's also uh, clearly writing in a way that he's an eyewitness to much of this. See, Luke is a, is a physician. Uh, he's a, a traveling companion of Paul. He's a co-worker with Paul in his ministry. And uh, he's also an apostle. I, I, Of course, how do you define what an apostle is? Uh, when Judas killed himself, the remaining apostles took it upon themselves, I think, to uh, choose a replacement and they drew lots between two men and it was determined that Matthias would be the replacement for Judas. Uh, we don't hear anything about Matthias after that and I, I don't think we should necessarily conclude that Matthias was a failure and never did anything. There's a lot of the apostles that we really, their names are not mentioned throughout the rest of the Bible. Um, but um, So I, I don't think we should necessarily conclude that Matthias failed, um, but the, the the apostle that most people think is is the replacement was uh, to be decided by Jesus later on on the road to Damascus. He chose Saul of Tarsus, who would become the apostle Paul, and so most people would conclude that Paul should have been the replacement, but the the uh, the apostles were. Um, too anxious and took it upon themselves to uh, replace Judas. Uh, but the, when they were deciding how to get a replacement, they had criteria. And one of the criteria was that they must be an eyewitness to the risen Christ. Uh, so uh, Paul, of course, serves um, uh, that. That is uh, certainly true about Paul. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and he appeared to, appeared to him many, many times over the years, as, as I think we'll see in this uh, this chapter here, that uh, um, it was not just a one-time appearance to Paul. Uh, for, uh, so Paul is a, a legitimate apostle, and he's recognized by the other apostles, and even though... Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people who challenge his apostleship, and Paul ends up even defending, having to defend his apostleship uh, in some of his writings. You can see that he's uh, he hates to do it, but he 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 boasts. He says in, in all the suffering, all the things he's gone through, and he's just as much as an apostle as anybody else because Jesus appeared to him and and has instructed him over the years. Um, but why am I getting into this question of apostleship? I think that there's a, another use of the word uh, and that there's another subset of apostles that, and, and I think Luke would be classified as one of those. We also have uh, maybe Barnabas, um, uh, Apollos, uh, that we would, and Silas, we, we could also classify them as apostles. Uh, but the point I'm getting at is that, that Luke was not only uh, Paul's physician, traveling companion, co-worker in his ministry, but Luke was also um, a very reputable historian. And that's why I wanted to uh, point out that right here in these verses and throughout the book of Acts, Luke is meticulous in, in uh, explaining in great detail uh, you know, all the different people, all the different places, the journey from place to place. It's a real detailed historical record. And, and so uh, historians who've, who've looked at all this and studied it, they, they, they will give uh, Luke credit as being a historian of the highest order. Uh, but uh, so... When it, we see the, worst, the use of the word we and us, that's because Luke is writing it from his perspective as an actual participant in all these things. And when it was determined that we should sail, well, Luke's there with Paul. I'm going to read those verses um, uh, in the Amplified. I, I like to look at the Amplified because it's, uh, 
it's kind of a, a commentary trans slash translation. Um, sometimes it's, it's helpful to get a little more information. Uh, now the Amplified also, um, they put uh, named titles for the chapters and subtitles throughout the chapters. And the title that they've chosen for this chapter is Paul is sent to Rome. In verse 1, now when it was determined that we, I might see here in the Amplified, it even puts in parentheses, including Luke. So they've come to the same conclusion that I just uh, stated here, that it's because Luke is saying we, then he's uh, including himself as one of those sailing up for Italy. Uh, now when it was determined that we, including Luke, would sail for Italy, they turned Paul and some other prisoners over to a centurion of the Augustan regiment named Julius, and going aboard a ship from Adramitian, which was about to sail for the ports along the west coast. You see the, the great detail here. He's meticulous. Uh, and this is, this is one of the reasons why we can have so much confidence uh, in the scriptures. Um, it, it, the, the Bible is a history book. Uh, it's an actually perfectly accurate history book. Um, and we put out to sea, and Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, accompanied us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, uh, treating Paul with thoughtful consideration, allowed him to go to his friends there and be cared for and refreshed. So they're treating Paul with a lot of consideration and respect, uh, even though he technically is a prisoner. Um, verse 4, From there we put out to sea and sailed to the leeward sheltered side of Cyprus for protection from weather, because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia on the south coast of Asia Minor. There the centurion Julius found an Alexandrian ship, a grain ship of the Roman fleet, sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. Uh, for a number of days we sailed slowly and arrived with difficulty off Sinaitis. Then, because the wind did not allow us to go far farther, we sailed under the leeward sheltered side of Crete off Salmone, and hugging the shore with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lycia on the south side of Crete. Um, some people might think that I'm uh, over-emphasizing these points, but I, I think these are really uh, very important points for us to understand, that the use of the word we and us tells us that Luke is writing as an eyewitness, and therefore uh, he, he's... Uh, he knows these facts because he saw them. He's, he's a participant. And then he writes with great detail, and that gives us confidence uh, that this is a, uh, a history book to, to, to give us all the facts as closely and detailed as possible. Back to the KJV for verse 9. Now when, we, now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them, the fast was passed, that's uh, the holiday, um, let me see verse 9 in the Amplified. Now much time had been lost, and navigation was dangerous, because even the time for the fast, the Day of Atonement, was already over. So, in the KJV it just refers to as the fast. But the Amplified, we learned that the fast is referring to the Day of Atonement. Um, verse 10, And said unto them, Sirs, this is Paul speaking to, to the, uh, the ship's captain and, and everyone. He says, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Now, Paul says he perceives it. Uh, there, there's a time in one of Paul's epistles when he's talking about uh, 
what he's writing is uh, the words of God, but he said, but now I'm writing my own opinion. He, he, he specifies that this is not to be taken as God's word, but this is just my own personal opinion. He draws the distinction. I don't remember which epistle he does that, but, but it, it certainly should make us think that, uh, well, uh, there are maybe some things he's writing here that's just, uh, is it because God revealed it to him? Or is it because he's just writing according to what he thinks and what he saw? Well, this verse here makes me wonder about that. It says, uh, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt. Uh, so is this Paul just uh, um, observing and seeing that the weather's bad and they shouldn't go on, it's too dangerous, and, and that he's, uh, he's warning them? Or... Uh, is this because God has revealed it to him? Maybe as we continue on, we will be able to better conclude which it is. Uh, verse 11, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those which were spoken by Paul. So, uh, you know, they ignore Paul's warning and decide that, hey, it's, it's not too... Uh, the weather is not too bad to continue. Verse 12, And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, uh, and more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Fenice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest, again, such great detail, so that... Uh, if you you know you got a map, you could really just chart this out and draw a line saying they went here and there in this this particular time, and it took so long. And there, it's uh, it's just another reason that we should have great confidence in the the truth of this. Uh, verse thirteen. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close to by Crete. But not long after, there arose yet a tempestuous wind called uh, Euroclidon. Let's look at verse 14 in the Amplified. I want to see why this wind is called Euroclidon. Verse 14 in the Amplified. Uh, by the way, the, this, before this verse, it, it has a subtitle in the Amplified, and it's titled Shipwreck. So that's the subtitle for this portion of scriptures coming up. Uh, but soon afterward, a violent wind called Euroquilo, a northeaster, a tempestuous windstorm like a typhoon. Whoa. That's typhoon. That's like a hurricane. Very powerful, destructive wind. Came rushing down from the island, and when the ship was caught in it and could not head again against the wind to gain stability, hmm. We gave up, and letting her drift, were driven along. So uh, it's getting really bad, just as Paul was, had warned them. Um, verse 16 in the KJV, And running under a certain island, which is called Clotta, we had much work to come by the boat, which when uh, they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. And being, uh, and we, being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted, lightened the ship. Uh, so they're throwing things overboard. Uh, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Wow. It's got to be pretty darn extreme for you to show, throw over the tackling and uh, other things. Let, let's see how that's phrased in the Amplified. We ran under the shelter of a small island 25 miles south of Crete called Clotta. With great difficulty, we were able to get the ship's skiff. It's a skiff, that's a footnote for footnote C. This was a small boat towed behind the ship for transportation to and from shore 
or as a lifeboat for emergencies in a violent sea it might collide repeatedly with the ship and cause major damage. So what did they do with the skiff? And with great difficulty, we were able to get the ship's skiff on the deck and secure it. So there's the little boat that was being towed behind the ship. They brought it up on the ship. They said it was very difficult, but they got on the ship and they secured it. After hoisting the skiff on board, they used support lines for frapping to undergird and brace the ship's hull. And fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis off the north coast of Africa, they let down the sea anchor and lowered the sails and were driven along backwards with the bow into the wind. So we get all this detail about all the maneuvering they're doing, trying to uh, survive this, uh, this horrible storm, this typhoon. On the next day, as we were being violently tossed about by the storm and taking on water, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle, the spare lines, blocks, and miscellaneous equipment overboard with their own hands to further reduce the weight. Wow. Let's go back to KJV verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all the hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So it looks like everybody's like given up hope and think they're doomed. Or they're going to be shipwrecked and probably all drowned. Verse 21, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, Ye should have hearkened unto me. <laughs> God. I think they're probably going to all say yes. They're going to agree with that. Ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. Uh, there's the I told you so. A great one. And to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but the ship. So when Paul states this, in this way, I'm confident that, that uh, this is a revelation from God. He could not just make that kind of claim, a prophet, prophetic type of a claim about, uh, about how it's going to all work out uh, it's, it, with detail. In other words, no man's life will be lost, but the ship will be lost. And he's, he's predicting, he's pro prophesying. Uh, so this is definitely a word from God. Verse 23, for there stood by me this night the angel of God. Okay, so here we have in verse 23, it says, for there stood by me this night. So it seems to me that his previous announcement before they left Crete was Paul's own fears and speculation. But now uh, uh, time has passed, days have passed, and Paul says, this night, the angel of God. So just then, the angel of God has appeared to them and, and, and revealed this to, them, to Paul, uh, whose, whose I am. Let me read the whole verse correctly. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am. So in other words, he belongs to this God, and this angel is from God, uh, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. So, of course, it's God's, God's desire. He wants Paul to go before Caesar. And uh, if, we, if we think back on when Paul made the decision to go, and he was warned by a prophet that if you go to Rome, you're going to be bound, you're being a prisoner. It's not going to be good. And Paul said, I'm compelled by God to go. And... Uh, and here it's confirmed that uh, God uh, says, God hath given thee all them that, sh that sail with thee. Um, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God 
that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. So God revealed to Paul, they're going to be shipwrecked, cast upon an island. Verse 27, but when the 14th night was come, wow, two weeks of this, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country and sounded and found it twenty fathoms, and when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. So it's getting more shallow, they're getting closer to land. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Verse 29. Let me read that portion in the Amplified. Starting with verse 21. After they had gone a long time without food because of seasickness and stress, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have followed my advice and should have not have set sail from Crete and brought on this damage and loss. But even now I urge you to keep up your courage and be in good spirits because there will be no loss of life among you, but only loss of the ship. For this night, for this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me and said, Stop being afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has given you the lives of all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I believe God and have complete confidence in him that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. Uh, but we must run the ship aground on some island. The, the 14th night had come and we were drifting and being driven about in the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors began to suspect that they were approaching some land. So they took soundings using a weighted line and found the depth to be 20 fathoms, 120 feet, and a little farther on, they sounded again and found the depth to be 15 fathoms, which is 90 feet. Then fearing that uh, we might run a aground somewhere on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern to slow the ship and kept wishing for daybreak to come. There's a lot of people that they don't believe the Bible is is uh, is true, in 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 in, uh, in completely, they completely disbelieve it, or they partly disbelieve it. Uh, to me, it is it is the word of God, and and it is completely true, and it is a, a history book. As we're seeing here, this is a detailed historical account of these people and these events. And that's the way the Bible is from the ver Genesis all the way through the whole Bible. It's a historical account of peoples and events. Um, everything, and none of it we should take to be, oh, just, just take that, like, well, that's just an allegorical, that's just symbolic. I mean, there are allegories, there are symbols in the Bible too, but people are very quick to dismiss things like, uh, the flood and Noah and the animals and or, or the uh, um, jo uh, um, uh, Jonah being in the belly of the whale and you know that and the, these things people are quick to dismiss as they're just allegorical. That's not not true. But no, these things are true events also. Um, I have confidence in that. Verse, verse 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they 
would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Huh, that's kind of like a salvation verse there. Right? You've got to abide in the ship, which is Jesus. Jesus is our salvation, our safety. We're, they we're, we're, we're safe from judgment and condemnation um, as long as we stay in Jesus. Uh, well, I should not phrase it as long as we stay in Jesus. Once we enter into Jesus, then we're, we're safe and secure until the end. Um, and, and it's also Noah's Ark is a picture of Jesus and salvation. Um, uh, you're safe in the Ark. You're saved uh, from from the flood. Um, verse 32, Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat uh, to eat something, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Well, they're probably they're seasick. Uh, the storm is so intense, they probably don't have the stomach to eat. Uh, and uh, also fear, and also the, the effort and the work, just that they probably have to tie themselves down to not be cast off of the boat in the storm. And so uh, they're not really thinking about eating. So they've fasted. They haven't eaten for 14 days. And Paul's telling them, you take time, force yourself to eat now. Verse 34, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a, a hair fall from the head of any of you. That, uh, Paul's confident. I, I wonder how many of them are confident in Paul's words. He's certainly trying to assure them. Verse 35, And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer. So his message did cheer them up. And uh, they, they probably, I guess they believed him and were confident that they were going to survive. And they all took some meat. And we were in all, this is we, and we, of course, this is uh, Luke writing, he's there and uh, uh, in the, completely uh, uh, involved in the entire thing as a, as a, as a member of the, the ship. And we were in all in the ship, 200, three score and 16 souls, 260. 76, 276 people. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. So, it's such a desperate situation, they have to lighten the ship, they're even throwing the food overboard. Verse 39, And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible to thrust in the ship a creek. Maybe it's a river coming out into the ocean. Now, verse 40, And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and ho hoised uh, up the mainsail to the wind, and made sh toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So it's still a violent storm. I mean, this is for two weeks this storm has gone on. 40, verse 42, And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. Yeah. And rather than letting them escape, they, they had to they kill them because the, the soldiers were responsible. If, if, a, if a prisoner escaped, then the penalty to the soldier for letting them escape was a, it was a capital crime. They would be executed. So the prisoners, rather than letting them escape, they would opt to kill them. 
but verse 43, but the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Just as Paul had prophesied, they all made it safely. I'm going to read this final verses here in the Amplified. Uh, While they waited for the, uh, the, dawn, the day to dawn, Paul encouraged them all and told them to have some food, saying, This is the fourteenth day that you have constantly been constantly on watch and going without food, having eaten nothing. So I urge you to eat some food, for this is for your survival. For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. And he broke it and began to eat. Then all of them were encouraged, and their spirits improved, and they also ate some food. All told, there were 276 of us aboard the ship. After they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing the wheat from Egypt overboard into the sea. When day came, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay uh, with a beach, and they decided to run the ship ashore uh, there if they could. So they cut the cables and severed the anchors and left them in the sea, while at the same time unlashing the ropes of the rudders. There's such deep detail of how they had to uh, do all these particulars to um, uh, make this uh, successful. And after hoisting the foresail to the wind, they headed steadily for the beach. I mean, if this was a uh, fictional drama, uh, there's no fictional writer could, who could have written it any more spectacularly than, than this, but this is a uh, historical account of a real event. Verse 41, But striking a reef with waves breaking in and on either side, they ran the ship aground. The prow, the, the forward point, struck fast and remained immovable, while the stern began to break up under the violent forces of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would dive overboard and swim to land and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He commanded those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to the shore, and he commanded the rest to follow, some on floating planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it was that all of them were brought safely to land. Well, that concludes... Uh, chapter uh, 27, one final chapter remaining, and I'll, we'll do that next time. So uh, thank you all for, for watching. Uh, uh, I'd like to hear some comments or see some comments from you. Uh, to me, this is just a very exciting uh, account of, uh, of this great drama. Um, again, let me urge you all, to watch this entire series from the beginning. The playlist is the Book of Acts, a verse-by-verse verse commentary. Uh, thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.